So uh, to give brief introductions to our esteemed guests, the reputations precede them, but just to be really brief, um, so Shafi Goldwasser is the professor of computer science at UC Berkeley and the director of the Simons Institute for Theory of Computing. She's also a winner of the Turing Award. Uh, she's also a uh, uh, winner of the RSA Prize, has twice won the Girdle Prize for her contributions in mathematics and cryptography. Uh, Sylvia McCauley is a professor of computer science at MIT, also a winner of the Turing Award in the same year as Shafi, uh, winner of the Girdle Prize and the RSA Prize, and he's also a co-founder and inventor of the cryptocurrency Algorand. Uh, myself, I'm uh, Hasib Qureshi, I'm a partner at Dragonfly Capital, and I have the dubious distinction of sharply bringing down the average achievement level of this panel. So with that out of the way, let's talk cryptography. So, in 1976, Diffie and Hellman published a paper that began, we stand today on the brink of a revolution in cryptography. That was over 40 years ago. It feels today that we're standing on the cusp of a similar revolution in cryptography. The field is advancing faster than ever, there are more papers published than ever before, and we're seeing more deployments of novel cryptography than we've ever seen. What has it been like seeing this field explode over the course of your careers? Oh, to me, all right. Well, uh, first of all, uh, it has been uh, great fun, a great excitement, and a great collaboration. And in fact, actually, I believe it has been a very collaborative pro um, um, process. And um, we were um, very much amazed how much progress after a long, long uh, incubation we were able to do. But that was nothing to prepare us for the avalanche of uh, solutions and approaches when uh, you, witness, uh, when there is, you witness the birth of a field. So and a field is much more powerful than uh, individuals, and uh, it has been incredible uh, how much has been done. And, uh, uh, such a critical mass has been uh, uh, really a revolution and has been a great uh, honor and pleasure to be part of it. So I guess for my part, uh, what's amazing to me about these 40 years is that uh, it's really the, the emergence of what's happening today is basic science that was done 30, 40 years ago. Sort of ideas that were really um, sort of intellectually very fascinating, the fact that people communicate without meaning, the fact you can compute on data, distributed protocol consensus, and um, you know, we were very excited by it. But it didn't seem to reach the general public, and now it's kind of amazing to me, this entire industry <laughs> that's just kind of woke up um, at making all this basic science make impact on on our, our world. So I think that uh, it tells me that I'm amazed what's going to happen in 50 years from now. Who knows? Mm. Speaking of basic science, uh, the two of you, many of the audience might not be aware, but the two of you are actually uh, joint co-inventors of zero-knowledge proofs, which are now widely deployed and, and lauded in, in the blockchain space, uh, using Zcash and several other systems. And we now seem to be seeing, within the last few years, a real Moore's Law-like trajectory to zero-knowledge proofs where we're seeing newer and newer constructions arriving all the time. So Grot16, Bulletproof, Sonic, Supersonics, the acronyms just keep piling up. What do you attribute this to? And what do you expect, uh, when do you expect things will settle down and we'll see, we'll have a better understanding of what the landscape of zero knowledge proofs will actually look like? So I guess uh, maybe I'll take this one first. Um, I attribute it to money. <laughs> the fact that people understood that you want privacy anonymity on top of blockchains that have become so popular and so promising in terms of their uh, usability. And also the fact that science is becoming more inter interdisciplinary. I don't necessarily mean just science. So I was just last week in a conference on law and algorithms where people from the law are interested in zero knowledge proofs or what it can give them in addition to what you can do by legal standard means. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, just much more communication among different fields and they're realizing the potential of this incredible mechanism uh, which seems impossible if you just think about it. That you can really verify facts with learning nothing, but not learning the facts. And this has wide applications in lots of industry. I mean, there are already works on disarming nuclear warheads in zero knowledge and testing whether DNA match or DNA doesn't match for suspects and crimes. And now it's coming into the legal world. I think it's boundless. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that I understood the spirit of the question or whether I disagree with uh, the, uh, the implied conclusion. Yes, there has been uh, zero knowledge uh, on the left, zero knowledge is upside down, zero knowledge on the run, zero knowledge on a peak of a mountain. And they say, when are we going to find peace and quiet? Who needs peace and quiet? I think part of excitement is that there has been always continuous deployment of newer and newer technology. Isn't this what we are made for? I believe so. So I, 
you know, we, I bought a car way before I should have waited for the next model or the model after that or for the super electric car that never needs to be charged. I mean, otherwise I would have walked all, all my life. I think it's very good actually, it should be welcome that there is such a, a dynamic field in zero knowledge. Everybody, once you realize we can constrain the amount of knowledge that we want to release to our, uh, uh, to our desires, we should have you know, more, um, um, more technology of this and more uh, uh, innovation, not less. I completely agree. At the same time, as a, you know, a blockchain is designed to be this immutable ledger with a set of rules that continues on. And so what, what advice would you give to somebody who's looking at this rapidly changing uh, field of technology but thinking, okay, I need to freeze the technology at one point in time and build my blockchain on that. What advice would you give this? No! Thing? So I would <laughs> reject completely the, the argument. Okay, listen, what is sort to be immutable is uh, the sequence of blocks, but not immutable the way we construct them, the way we organize the blockchain. A blockchain should be live. It should not be whatever I launch with is going to be fixed in time and now we are frozen, because otherwise we are going to have a suboptimal blockchain. Let, as you guys know, life is about intelligent adaptation. If you get tired of adapting, well, you know, let somebody else take your place, okay? So, blockchains had to be um, self-governed, but, you know, but alive and changing. And uh, in a consensual manner, we want to renew ourselves. The chain, what is put there, the content stays, but the way we organize the blockchain should should change, and I don't buy the fact that uh, we want to declare beforehand and being always tomorrow and the day after whatever best we thought of today, because there is no such a thing. So yeah, there are different levels of abstraction. One abstraction is sort of in the lower level, exactly how it works and what speed you get and what scale and so forth. And people, you know, the best technologies are working on it. Truthfully, especially in Algorand, I think they're all sitting there. But, but there are levels of abstractions for most of the people I would imagine that are working on blockchains is how you use it, what are the applications, you know, how do you interchange things between different blockchains, is it permissible or not? So the levels of, so that if you think about it as an abstract, as an abstract, what it gives you, the operations, and, what you could do with it, why, why do you have to worry about what's underneath? There's enough technologies that are doing that. So I really think it's just a level of yeah. abstraction. It's not like, let's wait to see what the best one is. Try to think now, before it's too late, what the applications are that you are gonna be you know, first rather than last. So one more thing on this, if I may. So uh, Nakamoto consensus, proof of work, right? He has been this diluted uh, sort of consensus. Why? Because the traditional agreement protocols were too cumbersome to run among uh, uh, millions or billions of people. But now we, fi we find the emergence of blockchains that uh, they can agree on, on each and every single block. Why? Because they can uh, run a general agreement algorithm. And what do they agree upon? 99.9 .9 of the time on the next block. But if you have a general agreement algorithm powering the blockchain, you can agree on anything, a new monetary policy, and new technical advances of the protocol and so on and so forth. So blockchains, if they have the right type of agreement, can actually be sparing innovation and can self-rejuvenate. And this is the blockchain we, we deserve uh, and love. So that's a great example of abstraction, right? So there's agreement, but it's not necessarily agreement on a block. You gotta think sort of bigger. So Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, he famously invented uh, a longest chain proof of work system under a pseudonym. And the majority of the early developers of Bitcoin, Ethereum, Monero, they were all hackers who operated outside of the academic establishment. Uh, and now we're seeing blockchains start to become more heavily researched and, and, uh, and uh, brought, brought into the fold of, of academic research. Both of you have been academics for the majority of your careers. Why do you think blockchains evolved primarily outside of academia? So first of all, I don't think they've all primarily outside of academia in the following sense, that this proof of work idea is something that appeared in the literature in the context of spam by uh, Cynthia Dwork and Moni Noor. So the, the, the techniques that are under, underneath uh, blockchain, like proof of work, is not from, it is from academia. Maybe most people don't know that, but that's a fact. But the fact that it, you know, I mean, the fact that uh, the blockchain itself, the idea that you can do currency this way, that's completely due to, you know, Bitcoin. And why did that emerge? Because it's talking about money. <laughs> to me, it's very clear. It's an application. But the technique itself does not emerge from that. How do you expect, uh, given now that the, the academia has taken more interest in blockchain, how do you expect that research agenda to, to 
be shaped differently going forward? Well, you know, um, I, I think you know, very often you find that uh, academics, right, so are not at the frontier of the application. The application comes from the people, and, and, and so somehow, however, what academia can contribute is to add more depth and uh, technical sophistication because very initially uh, a good idea brings you a long way, but then uh, um, human appetite is much bigger, and then uh, we need a bit more technology to go to the next uh, mile and the next uh, thousand miles and so on and so forth. So I think it's right. You know, I don't find anything um, uh, contrary uh, to the natural way of things. Academia is a specialized place where you tend to solve and get pride in solving very hard problems, but uh, most of the things that we need uh, can be solved by very low tech, and we should. And when things get tough, you know, you need the academics a little bit more, and it is very important that actually academics are responsive to the needs of society. So I think it is a very good uh, dialogue. Start right away, don't wait for uh, crossing all T's and all I's, and when, uh, when you need a really deep science, uh, convince them to come on board. They say, I have a great problem. What are you working on this avary tower on this? Uh, stupid old problems, I have a new problem from you. We are here for listen, to listen, and uh, we can help. We are willing to help. I, that's a great point that you made. And I think it, it seems that cryptography always has a, a push and pull between theory and applications. So um, when, when you two were awarded the Turing Award, it was for the paper in which you developed the notion of semantic security. Uh, and of course, the origin of this paper was that you guys were trying to fix a protocol for playing mental poker, which is, uh, for those who are not aware, it's a way of playing poker uh, uh, remotely through a cryptographic protocol. And you know, blockchain similarly seems to be an application that's now really driving forward a lot of theory in places that were previously somewhat underexplored in, within academia. Um, how would you characterize the push and pull in cryptography between theory and application, and how has blockchain played a role in moving particular areas of, of research to, to higher interest? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic observation. It's absolutely true that uh, there is a, a back and forth. I mean, in my opinion, it does start with some sort of simple toy uh, theory idea, because even the mental poker was just a paper, mm. sort of like, wow, isn't this cool that we can do this with theory? And then we found sort of a, a theory bug. Uh, and then we realized that this means that you need to fix it. You need a new notion of security for encryption. You have to figure out how to encrypt single bits, and then from that, compute on single bits, and so forth. Um, and this goes back and forth. It, the, I think the interesting thing about cryptography is that it's had amazing impact. Right? Electronic commerce would not become about if they were in public crypto systems. And now with the blockchains, so um, it's sort of a natural thing. I mean, cryptography really, you know, if you think about Turing, if you think about, um, you know, his work on, on coding is probably more, better known, the fact that he was the inventor of the universal Turing machine. So there's some fascination about cryptography. It's very inherent importance, sort of the, to define uh, information, knowledge, finding out, uh, computing. And um, it's very close to the heart of theoreticians. And yet, when you have a good idea, it immediately kind of opens new markets. And, that's what I have to say? Well, I don't know. What I should add, maybe, you know, something like, uh, uh, yes, you need the interplay um, uh, of uh, theory and application. And uh, somehow, however, <laughs> sometimes the application are uh, kind of, you know, um, uh, slow to follow. Uh, the, the paper that uh, Shafi and I wrote, we were graduate students, and uh, nobody wanted to publish this paper until uh, they gave us uh, this uh, award 25 years later, so there is some lack of time. So sometimes I get impatient at the, uh, at the, the lag of time that it takes for uh, theory to get applied into practice. And, uh, and uh, why to complain? You know, in my last, uh, last case with this new idea of this blockchain that I had about Algorand, I said, you know what, rather than complaining, you know, roll up your sleeve and, and uh, do some application. So I started a company. I think it, it, it is a very natural, natural um, uh, dialogue between theory and application. And when you feel that you know, there is a little bit you know, too distant, throw your hat into the arena and do it yourself. Uh, it actually helps. There is a lot of people entrepreneurial people out there, and there is a, um, a great system of venture capital, people who, who believe in new ideas, and uh, just do it. And so don't get uh, too impatient. I've been too impatient for too long until I decided right. to start uh, doing things, yeah. Well, we're all very thankful that you guys decided to throw your hats into the ring along with us. Yeah. Um, historically, cryptography has kind of been purely in the domain of achieving privacy, confidentiality, authentication. Um, but we're only now starting to see cryptography being used to tackle a much wider sphere of problems, including you know, scaling computation, distributed consensus, 
decentralized identity, and of course, with cryptocurrencies, now the creation of money. Uh, what surprised you most about seeing this new uh, you know, Cambrian explosion of applications for cryptography? So actually, I think that um, it's true that people think about cryptography as secret communication or authentication. But already in the 80s, in works of Silvio and also myself, we, we realized that the next phase is talking about computing, essentially, on data or multi-party computation with several parties, ex not just com sending information to each other, but actually computing on local information in some distributed fashion to get uh, outcomes without revealing their data. So there's been tremendous work, actually, in the 80s on that. And now that's coming to fruition. Um, so this switch, you know, when you talk about security, it's not just about communication. It's really about computation and how you do it in a secure fashion. Uh, maybe it's surprising that it's taken a while to realize it, but um, I think we understood early on that the next stage after communication is really computation. How do you define it? How two, pe two people that have maybe, you are a hospital, I'm a, I don't know, a pharma company, you have data, I have data, we want to maybe help each other but not give each other our data. How do we do that, right. C keeping our you know, interests in check? So, uh, let's see, cryptography literally means in uh, Greek, uh, secret writing. And that was just the first application. Shafi told about uh, the power of abstraction. Forget about the messaging. What is going on in uh, secret writing is, is there are two people who wants to, what is their goal to communicate? And there is a third guy, a bad guy, who wants to understand what he should not understand. And so if you look at it this way, then you start feeling that uh, even secret writing is all about computation and interaction in the presence of an adversary. And then if you look at this way, by solving this problem of message delivering in the presence of an adversary, you are doing the first step towards computing and working in the presence of an adversary. And once you find and you, and the set tools, the tool of sets to solve this problem, actually, very naturally, solve another problem. In pseudo-random number generation, you want to produce bits, and an adversary wants either to buy them or to predict them. You want to do a proof. So the adversary wants to convince you of a falsehood. You want to do anything. So if you Strange enough, we were solving a much more general problem, and we were solving in the instantiation of message delivery. And once we figure out, say, hey, that is actually interaction in the presence of an adversary, because unfortunately adversaries are everywhere, so we finally realized that we had actually the techniques and the mathematics to go way, way beyond the original design. I just want to add one example, so uh, Silvio sort of reminded me. Even the idea of simultaneity, so if we are far apart from each other, there is no real simultaneity. Think events don't happen at the same time. So you want to exchange secret or sign a contract, so I sign if and only if you sign. But you sort of emulate simultaneity, sort of it looks like it's simultaneous and therefore it's defined as simultaneous. So there's another type of interaction which is not communicate privately. It's not com about private communication. It's not about private computation. It, it's, it's nothing about privacy. It's about simultaneity and trust, right? We want to generate the, make sure that you cannot betray me, you know, when we're both signing at the same time. And that's sort of a special case of the whole blockchain thing, right? So you distributedly decide instantaneously, hopefully, with one blockchain or another, what the block is and then and that, as it follows. But this is all generalization yeah. of this idea of two people who want something to be true. They don't trust each other. Here's not a third adversary. It's like, we don't trust each other. And we want to be able to use mathematics to sort of emulate that, that idea of simultaneity. Well, let me ask you, what, what is an application of cryptography that we haven't seen yet, but that you suspect we'll see in the next 10 years? <laughs> I think that um, it will change the way that people actually acquire. I, I think it will change the economy in the way that people do mergers and acquisitions and companies get together. How so? Because because there's such a, you know, because we can do things in zero knowledge, we can verify due diligence, we can do a lot of things that these days require some kind of revealing of information. We can verify the tax returns were filed um, following the rules, and uh, people are not doing that now because they think that it's impossible to co codify these uh, things, uh, these sort of um, human written contracts. But I believe that this will be doable, and that means that you could do procedures in a different way, and that would generate a new type of economy. Well, you know, the real long-term prediction, I hope I'm not able to predict, otherwise the future will be boring. 
<laughs> so, so, uh, but at the, um, one thing it is fair to say is that the decentralization will require a, a massive injection of cryptography. And the way cryptography works is very often works behind the scenes. So even non-cryptographers don't, re don't realize that when they go to a website, say bankofamerica.com, their browser knows with whom they're talking. So the real successful cryptography is successful because you don't even know if it's there, but keeps the whole thing working properly. So if you don't find that if decentralization occurs and say, Silvio said the cryptography was going to help, there is a decentralization, but no cryptography, uh -uh. think twice, because it's behind the scene, decentralization requires the security and cryptography. Fair enough. All right, so we're, we're short on time. So to close out the panel, I have one final question, which I know will be close to your hearts. Um, how do you feel about the cryptocurrency community co-opting the term crypto? Oh! <laughs> well, I'm not offended. <laughs> I'm honored. So I remember there was um, uh, quite an you know, off-topic, but uh, at some point in time, there was uh, a, a, a Bill Gates who uh, declared that he was inspired by Leonardo, uh, da Vinci and he actually even acquired and, 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 and posted some of the very drawings of Leonardo. And this association between Bill Gates and Leonardo, some are very uptight uh, academics uh, and scientists says, who do the, the guy thinks he is, right? No, he's not Leonardo, right? He's, uh, I find actually this the most offensive things because even more and more people, in my opinion, should be inspired by Leonardo. And cryptography is such a beautiful um, field and so useful to humanity that more and more people should try to co-opt the word crypto. So if uh, I'm, I'm in, in, uh, in love with the applications of the, the, uh, the, the blockchain community and the cryptocurrency are doing good crypto, and if some other use which is socially useful wants to say, I'm the new crypto, hat off. I'm not offended at all. I hope actually happens more often. Shafi, I noticed you cross your arms right before you were about to answer. <laughs> I must say that uh, I must really be being, I'm still in the ivory tower because I had no idea that anybody was co-opting the term crypto, but you know. <laughs> but well, now, you, now that you know, what is your response? I think it's ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous. <laughs> All right. And with that, thank you so much, uh, Shafi and Silvio. And it was an honor to, honor to chat with you both. Thank you very much. <laughs>